Welcome to the Novelty Podcast. My name is Alexandra and I love reading literature from an English literary analytical nerdy perspective. My name is Emily and I have a background in writing and editing so when I read that's the perspective I read from. So today we have a new podcast episode for you and we're focusing on a single title King Leopold's Ghost by Adam Hochschild. It's an excellent book that we both read, but before we get into that, we actually have some housekeeping to do which from, from the previous episode, which is really, really fun. Which the previous episode was perfect characters, but not perfect as in we love these characters, perfect as in why did you have to make this person perfect? Nobody is perfect. <laughs> so if you haven't listened to that episode yet, go back and listen to it. I think you'll enjoy it. But Emily was <laughs> reflecting on it and realized she had the perfect quote to... I know. After we were done, like the next day, I was like... I remembered the quote um, from Jane Austen in one of the letters she wrote to her sister Cassandra where she wrote, perfect people make me sick and wicked. And I was like, oh, how did we forget to use that? It should have been the opening line. Absolutely. As usual, Jane Austen really sums it up. She just, it's the end. Like, okay, what else do we need to say? And then I got a really great question on YouTube where our show goes up on YouTube and also on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. All the places. All the places. And the question was, how do you tell the difference between a character that actually represents somebody that we should be admiring versus a character that ends up being a Mary Sue? And I have a very long like diatribe that I can go on, but I'm going to try and keep it short. But really what it comes down to is that it's the difference between an archetype and a stereotype. And what a stereotype does for us is, which we really were talking around the issue of the stereotypes of idealized feminine behavior in, you know, American culture, the idealized stereotypes of masculine behavior, again, kind of from this Western American kind of lens. Anglo background. Exactly. And so in creating those stereotypes, they actually become prescriptive rather than descriptive. And they tell us what we should Should be in order to be a woman or to be a man or to fulfill these ideas for our our society as opposed to giving us something to aspire to be it's what you ought to be you're lacking if you're not or something that you can aspire to be and so an archetype really functions within that where it doesn't require our main characters to be flawless even while they're portraying certain archetypes. One of my favorite examples that we didn't get to talk about too much is actually the character of Ripley from the Alien movies. And part of what makes her so so, like gender defying is because, well, well, you go. Well, we actually, I was listening to a podcast just all about aliens um, recently. And it turns out that the role was originally written for a male actor. And at the last minute, the studio was like, no, we want this to be a female character. And they did not rewrite the character. They were just like, oh, just go in and play it. And Mm -hmm. I think that's why she works so well. Because there's no, like, her trying to be this or her trying to be that. There is actually a character that was written as a female in that film. Mm -hmm. And does do a lot of the classic female things. She breaks, Mm -hmm. she's the one in the room that breaks down crying. You know, has, like, a lot of emotional issues. You know, and so I think Ripley in not being, you know. Gendered. Gendered, but but like honestly them having to just kind of be like, oh, she's a person. Mm -hmm. It makes it much easier for you to be like, I want to be like this character rather than (laughs) her being like, this is how you should be behaving as a lady on a spaceship. Right. And in her leadership, part of what makes her leadership great is she herself is not a character person without flaws. It's not that she doesn't have fear. You know, maybe there are we're... moments where you sense that she's mm-hmm. very frightened and she's pushing herself through. Right. You don't ever get the sense of like, oh, this is no big deal. Right. Like, no, she's honestly frightened. She's just not letting herself be overcome by it. Right. And so we could compare that particularly with the main character from Red Rising who would not be portrayed sure. in that way. Right. He has no fear. He has no problems. This Everything is, so is easy. fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm so hyper competent that nothing throws me for a loop. And what a leader like Ripley does is if she then says, oh, I feel fear just like you, but I can call you up to behaving to with be, yeah. courage. To push through this, like, exactly. I can do this, so can you. Exactly, and I have flaws like you, so you can be like me. And so, and that, again, is part of the alienated quality of perfect characters is you walk away from perfect characters going, well, I could never be like them because I'm not perfect, and I already know Right, that. you don't connect at all with them because ultimately they don't feel human. Yeah, so... Excellent question. So appreciate it. If you guys have questions, go ahead and leave them. You can email us at 
uh, info at novel, wait, we'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously if you're watching on YouTube, you can leave us a comment and we will be happy to answer yeah, this Yeah, excited you. to. Yeah. Okay. So the other piece of housekeeping is what we're drinking on the Novelty Podcast. What you got, Emily? I'm doing Herney and Sons Victorian London Fog today. Which Fancy. is just like, this is the Christmas present I get every year from my husband. He just gets me a new can because he knows like, this is all I need in my life to make right. it through. And height of betrayal, I'm having a latte, a coffee latte <laughs> today. We needed a little bit more caffeine. We just so needed to... this is not the novelty podcast for me, but it can be for you if you drink <laughs> tea right now. It's a little bit of a rough subject and sometimes you need a little amping up for that. It's true. It's true. Okay, so tell me a little bit about how you ran across this book, because you recommended this book to me. Right. So, so how did you find it? Right. So I actually saw like a really brief like news clip on Rwanda and what happened there, and it wasn't really enough to tell me the story behind it, just kind of like a, you know, brief mentioning of it. So I was like, I really like to learn more about that. So I uh, went on to my library app and like searched for books on Rwanda, and there were none. But... King Leopold's Ghost came up, which is about Belgium's involvement in Congo. And it was kind of one of those things where I was like, I remember hearing at some point that bad things happened. That like, I read, I read The Heart of Darkness and it looked bad. It didn't really tell me anything about the history, but those people were suffering. Well, and also I feel like, because I also had read Heart of Darkness, there's a certain amount of like unreality because you're like, this is fiction, yeah. right? This is, this is fiction, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it's also kind of odd and dreamy and you have to like interpret yeah. what it means. Right, and, right. So there's, yeah. So jumped into this. I was like at work, just listen to audiobooks. This book hit me real hard. Was kind of my first step in really changing my perspective on reading history, confronting like my own country's history. Yeah. You know, it really kind of put me on a path of like wanting to know more yeah. because I feel like this is a story we all should know. Yeah. And it kind of made me feel like icky that I didn't know anything about this. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this was a a really important book for me. Yeah. I, I was in a similar place and we had been talking about a variety of different ideas that we're kind of re-examining now that we're older. I think, you know, for many people, you know, you grow up in your parents' household and you adopt whatever worldview and political world, you know, approach or things, perspectives that things they Things are just said and you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. And, that's, and okay. That's, that's totally fine because that's what childhood is. But then there's also that process of self-actualization, that process of examining your own worldview, that process of re-examining your beliefs that we should do fairly regularly, obviously. Right. And um, so I was in a similar spot kind of reviewing certain things that I just assumed to be true. Right. For me, I was kind of looking at the, like the Black Lives Matter movement and like really re like digging into like why we were still dealing with the question of racism when it was like as a 90s kid like we were like yay you know and then I'm colorblind like we've put race to bed blah 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 and, and then we kid had growing up in the type of houses we did where it's like there's no issues yeah, there's no such done. thing as racism right. like we we dealt with that we did you know we did the emancipation we did civil you know rights. civil so rights we're good. we're good we're done and so having to be like well clearly we're not <laughs> yeah like because this is clearly still a point of unrest right so i don't get to say when it's done you know and so similarly we were talking about issues like that and you recommended this book to me and it is in fact it's a tough read i would say it's yeah yeah you have to go in knowing that like this is gonna one this is gonna challenge you but at the same time, sometimes it's just really hard to read some of the passages. But for me, I've always felt like, you know, what right do I have to be like, oh, well, I don't want to know what happened. Like, I, mm -hmm. I want to look away from that suffering. Yeah. Like, I don't have the right to be like, no, nah, I just don't, I just don't want to look at it. Yeah. yeah. So who are our four main characters and characters loosely, yes. historical figures that this book focuses on? So I felt like this book is really about four people. You have two on the side of evil and two on the side of good. So on evil, we have King Leopold, who's the king of Belgium. And this is kind of his whole scheme that he's come up with, where he is a very frustrated royal because he, while he's the king of Belgium, like Belgium has a parliament, has its own governmental system, he's not really 
in power per se. And on top of that, Belgium is a really small country, so it right. doesn't really hold necessarily a lot of prestige power and, and prestige, right. even within like sort of the European mind. Right. Um, so even when he's dealing with other major countries, he's feeling like a second class citizen. Right. And Leopold can't handle that. So he has a little bit of a, maybe like a Napoleon complex, you might say. Yeah. I mean, I have heard like people like discuss that this might be a true example of a psychopath yeah. just from a lot of the different things that Leopold does and is. Um, but he decides he wants to own part of Africa. He wants to like, this is not like really Belgium owns Mm -hmm. The Congo, Leopold owns the Congo. Right. And he's definitely seeing like how rich the players who are already participating in colonialism right. are, are becoming. And he is realizing that, you know, there's kind of this open land that hasn't been claimed in Africa. I need to get, if I'm going to get in on the game, I need to get, get in, in on the game now and in Africa. Right. And so Henry Morton Stanley of the, you know, infamous Dr. Livingston, I presume story. Yeah. We apparently don't actually know if that's true or not because yeah. the guy was dead by the time that story came out. Anyway, Henry Morton Stanley is kind of Leopold's like boots on the ground. Leopold never leaves Belgium. Like he never mm -hmm. goes to the Congo. Stanley goes to the Congo and is is awful. Like I think I wrote in our show notes, like I don't even know how to describe this weirdo. Yeah. Because he's just murderous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he has a really interesting backstory. So Henry Morton Stanley was actually an orphan. He grew up in an orphanage in a boy's home. And it's possible that he maybe had some abusive experiences mm -hmm. there yeah. that really colored you know, who he would become. He also, you know, of course, never really know, knew who his dad was. So he, he becomes this person who can, he wants to forge for himself this identity. He wants to like, almost like make a mythology for himself. Mm -hmm. He's, yeah. he's mythologizing. Cause like his name isn't actually Morton Stanley. Like yeah. that's something he gives to himself and he like makes up who his father was, you mm -hmm. know, and all of these things about himself. And then, you know, this is a time of like the romanticized explorer where mm -hmm. like, the greatest like hero you can be at this time is someone who goes off into like some place like Africa and like comes back this hero, yeah. you know, who's conquered. Yeah. And so it it does seem kind of natural that a man as desperate to be, you know, someone. legend, yeah. you know, as Stanley would fall into this. I don't think that like that was a brutal period mm -hmm. just in general. I think Stanley goes down in history as one of the most brutal to yeah. get engaged in this. Yeah, and and I think maybe some trigger warnings are he, are appropriate at this juncture. This period in history includes a lot of violence. It obviously, it's race based violence. There's a lot of, you know, just ravaging and ruining of of towns um, and, and families and, families yeah. and things like that. So just be prepared if that's something that you're sensitive to. Then, you know. Give this one a pass. This is where we're going. Yeah. So he, you know, he goes into this wilderness and is just shooting people. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I heard, I listened to a podcast on him one time and it was literally titled The Man Who Shot His Way Through Africa. Right. And that's a very direct to the point. Like, yeah. we can't even, like, really make this cleaner. Like, that's yeah. just... He has no issues. Yeah, he would go into, you know, a village, would start just stealing their goods and taking their you know, whatever resources they had, and then would be surprised that they would like mount a resistance to this and, and be like, how, why the heck won't you let me just steal from you? And well, then just like shoot, shoot like yeah. seven, eight people. Because and then any be kind of resistance is like, well, I must respond in violence and right. murder. Like it's, it's, I mean, honestly, it's most likely like he's doing things to provoke these people in right. order to justify how he's reacting. Right. And then of course, you know, he, him having superior weapons and that sort of thing, they immediately kind of look, you know, sue for peace or whatever, back off. And then he's like, and then he can have this attitude of like, oh, well, they're, they're cowards and they, you know, and, and, ha and reinforce his own racist beliefs as well. Right. And that I have the right to do this. Right. Like there's a very strong, like both with like Leopold and Stanley, like in the, the sets of people that they represent, mm -hmm. you know, those who are ruling from Europe and those who are on the ground, there's very much a sense of like, well, I mean, I, I am superior, so I have the right to do this. Like right. we're not thinking of anyone besides ourselves as human. Yeah. In the midst of that, it's very interesting because of course, 
Leopold has set this up with a variety of different organizations with very similar He's names. Very crafty. <laughs> yes. That are going out to just explore and set up outposts. That's kind of how he puts it. He doesn't want Europe to really know that he's trying right. to get a colony. He's kind of doing it. Yeah, he's concerned that if, you know, Britain or France or like nations with larger, in essence, military powers who could like overwhelm uh, Belgian forces find out what he's attempting to do they'll just come and take it from him. Right. So he's trying to hide his attempts to colonize and like, honestly, very like, uh, charitable, mm -hmm. uh, structure of like, Oh no, I'm going in to, you know, help people in here. I'm setting up infrastructure so that we can have uh, free trade through this area. You know, he's using a lot of language that's like, don't, don't look at it that way. Yeah. Look at it as I'm doing good. Yeah. He had, um, several sort of organizations that indicated that it would be, you know, Christian organizations, charitable organization that is coming in to set this up. Meanwhile, he has another organization that has a very similar name that is not under any kind of leadership or board or whatever that he's siphoning money to that is actually, you know, going in and, going in and doing all of this. And it, and it, it really speaks to like this era of propaganda that he was really the first one I think in this time to use the press and use the media to ha create an image that was beneficial for him to be able to then set up seats of power in this area. He was incredibly effective in how he manipulated media. And I mean, I even heard one person say that like, when they talk about like the profits that he made off of Congo, it honestly seems a little bit low considering what he did, but that's likely because he spent so much money on media right. to mask this whole thing and to buy off reporters to say like everything is looking great and you know yeah. everything he's saying is true. Like he yeah. put a lot of effort into hiding this. Yeah. And then on the flip side, we have two other very important characters. Right. We have two reporters, uh, Casement and Morel, yeah. who also, I don't believe either of them ever go to Congo, but they figure Wait, out... Casement is the one who did the first report. Case, okay. Yeah. yeah. And Morel is the one that figured out just from like looking at the shipping records and yeah. like all of this military grade weaponry is going into Congo and he's just kind of like, yeah. well, like... In the news, we're talking about charitable things and, you yeah. know, just building some trade posts. Why are we sending all of this weaponry here? Yeah. And so both of them kind of work together to, like, basically figure out what the truth is. Yeah. And start, you know, waving the flag of, like, hey, guys. Yeah. This isn't what we think it is. Yeah. And Caseman actually met um, Joseph Conrad, who's oh, okay, part right. of Darkness. Yes, yes. So he, jo Joseph Conrad was kind of figuring it out. And anyway, there are a few people who were just kind of getting an inkling that something was not quite right. right yeah. And Casement really blew it off with his report. Morel was also sort of a master of media. He was this very charismatic yes. personality, loved giving speeches, really knew how to talk to the people and share this With, message. And got this into publications and yeah. ran his own newspaper and was just like really, really... He was prolific. Know, yes, yes. Yeah. Like, and he, I mean, and like... It, his type of like his case is like really interesting to me because like he really had no stakes in this mm -hmm. like there was there was no nothing to actually tie into it he just realized what was going on and was like we got to stop this yeah. like i just I, I figured it out and I, that means i have to do something yeah the, the interesting thing i think with casement and where his motivation came from is that he's actually irish and he's a british citizen and he has a lot of tension around a, being yeah, feeling, a subject of england right right feeling a, a while it's not like anywhere near the same, like it, I, the Irish and also the Scottish like have a sense of oppression based on like how they became subjects yeah. of the British Empire. And so there's a lot of internal conflict over just accepting that. Mm -hmm. And for him, he even wrote like, oh, I felt like Ireland was Britain's first colony. Mm -hmm. And that's why he really resonated with this story and found it, you know, so appalling and touched him personally. Um, so we didn't cover this quite yet, but part of the book spends a really good amount of time kind of covering the history of colonialization. He does a really excellent job of putting this in context. Yeah. He doesn't just like throw you into Congo and be like, hey, this stuff is happening. He really, really constructs a whole narrative so that you understand like 
how is this possible? Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, it's not just possible just, like, to set up a flag somewhere and be like, this is my country. Yeah. You know, like, he really helps you understand. And I feel like that is extremely important because there are a lot of myths that float around about the colonization of Africa to this day yeah. that I certainly heard growing up, which were entirely not true. Yeah. So I feel like it was very important for him to, like, let's step back and find out where this started. Yeah. And really at the core of it is that the Congo is an extremely rich country. It has amazing resources natural wise. resources. Yeah. It has like copper, it has diamonds, it has the precious stones, and but above all, King Leopold is interested in rubber. Yes, it is a very, very rich in plants used to make rubber at that time because that was not a synthetic material at that time. And he also realized that like other countries were starting to create plantations in essence for rubber but at this time congo is like it mm -hmm. and as a lot of like european nations are building up their militaries rubber is becoming very important and so he's like we're going in hard and fast and just yeah. raising this place yeah and the, and this is where we see sort of colonialism in its purest form which is this outside militaristic company cu country with more power and more military power comes in forces the people who are there to do the labor of extracting the natural resources that then enriches the home country. I mean, in essence, they're treating Congo like a factory. Yeah. It's not, it's not a country, which I mean, like, to be clear, it is not a country. Mm -hmm. I think this book brings up, there's like 200 different people mm -hmm. groups that they just smash together and are like, oh, you are all the same now. Yeah. You know, like that's a complete, it's a, it's a very false border yeah. system but then they like basically smash everything together and it's not really a country to them it's a factory right. and these are my factory workers right so what are some of the practices that king leopold you know and part of his regime put into place for the most efficient extraction of these resources the one of the so the primary thing that he would do would be to separate families and to make that a huge threat of like you need to work for me and produce this rubber, otherwise you're never seeing your family members again. Mm -hmm. Which obviously, very effective in like starting this whole thing because mm -hmm. people honestly like believe that they're gonna be reunited with right. their families. That does not really happen. Right. I'm a huge, huge number, we're talking millions of people die yeah. producing this because I rubber is not- I think it's about not, 10 million people yeah, like, yeah. Like estimated because died throughout this whole period. It's not an easy thing to yeah. harvest, right. you know, it's very, it's laborious. I mean, yeah. And like they were also putting on incredibly stringent, um, like amounts of rubber yeah. that they had to produce every day in order to do that. They had to physically harm themselves in order to get that much rubber. So yeah. it was like, not just that there was a dangerous job, the amount that they had to produce per day forced it to become a extremely harmful job. Like yeah. it was, and this is not just like, like go out into the fields and pick you know some rubber like no it was a brutal brutal yeah. system and he had like really strict laws around like you couldn't cut down the vine the rubber vines or you know actually get rid of the, like the plants you had to like go through the process of harvesting it because they didn't want to ruin you know they the wanted it there to produce more yeah and and you also see throughout this story like psychopaths attract other psychopaths so there would be you know lots of other like little managers or lower level positions who right. are boots on the ground and you get you know the story a little bit of their backstory and you'd be like gosh that guy totally happy just killing all these people one of the big policies was of course cutting off hands if you didn't meet your quota you would have to or wait was that for the dead people no that was for the bullets oh for the bullets, bullets right. yeah which i mean so a huge part of like the legacy of uh, Belgium's involvement in Co Congo, it, it sounds extremely weird, but they had this policy where boots on the ground people could only use their weapons for very specific things. Well, the guys on the ground liked to go hunting. That was like a pastime and you weren't allowed to use your bullets for that so for, because you were really supposed to be using your bullets to suppress the population. Mm -hmm. So every at the end of every month, they had to account for their bullet use and because this was becoming an issue of like these guys weren't being very smart with their bullets, they started to put in a policy of you have to prove that you killed someone with this bullet by preventing us with a hand from the body. Yeah. So basically they started removing people's hands 
you know, not killing them, just removing their hands so they had like could have something in the month being like, yeah, I definitely used this bullet on a person here. And it just becomes this like truly bizarre hallmark of the Belgium occupation of Congo. Like the stuff that comes out of this story is just like, yeah, so over the top. You know, if it if this was a fiction novel, you'd be like, oh come on, yeah, really? That's no, that's yeah. not going to happen. So we have this process of someone of Stanley comes in, he shoots his way across Africa, sets up these outposts, sets out sets up these structures so that more people can come in, who then manage this process of extracting the rubber, primarily among other natural resources, which is forced labor, which they achieve through separating families. So they would basically take the women and children, children and like, yeah. like put them in a jail or you know, in essence, them up, in essence them. concentration camps. They right. started creating those. Who would then like die from starvation and disease and neglect. So all of the infrastructure that was there, all of the village life that was there, you can see with archaeological records and even historical records, like, oh, there used to be a healthy town of like two hundred people who used to live here. And now the fields are not being you know, taken care of. The, they had these really high food quotas that they also needed because they're yeah. extracting food because now there's all these white people here, you know, and all of these managers and, and men who, like, they need their food. Someone has to go get, provide me with food, right? But you've already, like, taken away all of the laborers. Like, now the women can't even go out and do that. The men are out harvesting rubber, dying and, and struggling and, and all Being of that. Being maimed and, you yeah. know. And, and then you're cutting off the hands of the people to, like, justify the, your use of bullets. So you have you know it's it's a complete destruction of society i mean yeah. it's it's there's like an incredible loss of life but it's also a complete destruction of culture right because you've separated so many people from their their villages and their communities and you're mixing you know mixing people up and no one is ever being able to like reunite with their like it's a complete destruction of all the people groups in this area yeah so uh, one of the other things that I thought was like really, really interesting, because whenever I heard discussions of this history and of this period, I was like, oh yeah, colonialism is bad, but nobody did it like the Belgians, like <laughs> King Leopold, he did it worse than everybody else. And it is true that Belgium becomes this um, point of concentration because of Casement and Morel, and rightly so. They're horrified by what's going on, and they really bring it to the international stage and say like hey we need to pay attention to this like this is absolutely out of control oh, yeah but the reality is is that what france was doing in africa was not that much different what england was doing in africa was not that much different i mean england in, in africa invented concentration camps like yeah. they they started that yeah and so what ha what really happens is that belgium becomes a convenient flashpoint for these people who are subjects of England to identify that something horrible is going wrong with very little political, you know, repercussions because Belgium is still not the super powerful nation right. on, the, on the national stage. And honestly, by the time this really comes to like a flashpoint, Leopold's at the end of his life. Yeah. He's not going to face any yeah. ramifications. Like it's like, oh, we know he's dying anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, there's nothing like, it's almost kind of like this moment of like, we're going to do right because right doesn't really require a whole lot of effort. It's mostly just yeah. like, we're we saying it's wrong. And we don't have to examine ourselves and English colonialism. We don't have to, you know, threaten our relationship with other superpowers on the world stage right. at this time. No one, that would be a poor political choice. Yeah, like England ruffling Belgium is a lot different than England ruffling France. Right. And then it also becomes like, you know, the beautiful um, state buildings that King Leopold built while he was king, yeah. they're still there. Yeah, he put a lot of the money he earned into building this very lionized reputation in Belgium and yeah. being like, look at me, look at my success as the king of this country. You know, like I'm, I'm the greatest king of this country and I've done all these things for this country. And his popularity in Belgium was very very high up to the very end. Mm -hmm. I find it fascinating and disturbing that what really turned Belgium against Leopold was honestly not the stuff coming out in Congo. It someone found out that he had a teenage mistress and it was kind of like, "Oh, no." And yeah. it's like, guys, he's murdering millions of people. Yeah. That maybe that maybe yeah. that's what the issue is. Yeah. And which is not to say that like this 
you know, 50-year-old king or 60-year-old king shouldn't be messing around with teenage girls, he and which he had a reputation of doing. He would have, yeah. you know, wherever he traveled, he would basically be like, I need a line of them coming to my but special it, quarters, you know? It honestly wasn't the fact that she was a teenager. It was like, your wife. Yeah. You know, what, what, like, you're a married man and yeah. you're supposed to be like, you know, this ideal Victorian, like, yeah. that was the issue. And it's Clutching like, my pearls. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And it's just like, okay, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what about post Leopold? Why is the Congo still a place that's decimated today? Okay, so, like, this is honestly the part of the book that hit me the hardest and made me start to really re examine, like, what I know and who I am in this like story because like you get this impression of like oh weren't these old tiny people so bad like yeah. you know and I as an American not even involved because this is about Europe right yeah Europe people so bad in the old times right and then he kind of continues on and does like it's a very brief section mm -hmm. but it's just kind of like hey I need you to know this keeps going on yeah and details like a really really atrocious moment of American involvement via the CIA in the Congo mm -hmm. and doing something that I was specifically told growing up America would never do that right America does not do that yeah you know and it was like oh America yeah. does that you know yeah. and it's like it I feel is like such an effective way to in the book because it's basically like you know you're a part of this story. Yeah. If, no matter what country you're in, you're a part of this story. Yeah. And it really, really was like, okay, if I was lied to about that, yeah. what else have I been lied to about? Yeah. Yeah, it really does a really good job of kind of very briefly setting up how neocolonialism works, which, right. you know, if you're familiar with history around like South America and our involvement there of setting right. up certain leaders to be favorable to American interests, that's basically what we have going on here. They had, I believe it was uh, a local leader kind of came up, but they, we felt like, oh, they're going to be backed by the USSR. So we don't want. Right. And also like, even at that time, mm -hmm. much of the resources and land in Congo still belong to either Belgium or France or Britain. Like they had come in and been like, oh, well, this is ours. Yeah. And the, the leader who rose up was like, hey, Congo should belong to, to itself. itself. Yeah. Like we, the people here are so impoverished because they're not allowed to own their own country, right. own their own land. And everyone was like, uh oh, yeah. This is not good. Yeah. These are not words we want to hear yeah. because, you know, they there's a lot of metal here yeah. that makes a lot of things for us. Right. And so the way that it works is you basically put up your own figurehead who's going to be very favorable to trade with your country right. and you basically bribe them with money or with trade deals or with um, loans on a national scale but with a lot of strings attached saying, oh, well, you have to, you know, only trade with us or you can't, you know, um, you know, rules about their GDP and how much trade that they do and things like that. And so it comes with a lot of strings attached. So even if you say, oh, well, they do have their own leadership, they do have their own government, we're still extracting resources, resources and in a way that's economically beneficial to, let's say, broader the West, right. you know, the global North, whatever you want to call and it. And this goes in all the way into the 90s. Right. We're not, we're not talking about the really the past here. Yeah. We're talking about like how long this has been going on and how much we are all a part of it. Yeah. And that's why I think things like reparations then become such an important conversation because it's not about like, oh, we're forgiving debt or we're, um, you know, helping out these poor countries that yeah. need our help. It's not this paternalistic thing. It's like, no, we, we enslaved your labor and never paid you properly for the right. value that we extracted. We caused the problems that right. you're having. Exactly. That was, you know, there was a really big, a strong moment for me um, on January 6th where I think it was George Bush put out this like statement saying, this is the behavior of banana republics. And I was just like, we as America started the first banana republic. Yeah. That is such a condescending thing. Just, yeah. We are at fault exactly. in those situations. And yeah. it's like, those are things that we're just not taught. Yeah. It's kind of just like, no, 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 let's, 
look at the American Revolution and how cool it was that yeah. we started our own country and, you know, we take care of our people. And it's like, a lot of stuff has happened yeah. since then that we might need to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting because even, you know, when we talk about I've, I've thought about this ever since I realized what a banana republic was, and I kind of learned about the history in uh, South America, South and Central America, with, you know, very much the same system being set up. And I find it very strange that we still have a clothing brand that I uses know. that name. I know. And it's a preppy clothing brand that, you know, represents, through its styling, yeah. old money. Well, I mean, their latest, like, line they put out is specifically colonial um, like colonial style. chic. Yeah, no, like, the, and they have, like, models in, like, vaguely egyptian styled backgrounds wearing, like, you know, explorer clothes from the 19th, and you're just like, oh, that doesn't yeah. feel good. Yeah, and it's, it's strange to me. Yeah. In this world where it's like, yeah, maybe let's not have a football team named the Redskins, that we still also have something like the Banana Republic as a clothing store and as a brand. I think that comes though from Romanticizing like, these yeah. times and ideals. I mean, because I feel like that comes though from like the, the complete lack of education yeah. that we're given on like, what is a Banana Republic and where did that come from? Yeah. Oh, that's bad. Because like, I certainly grew up with that term in the background and mm -hmm. had like no idea what that meant mm -hmm. or how serious that was or yeah. why that was an issue. You know, like these things are not often taught to us because mm -hmm. they're ugly yeah. and we don't want to talk about the ugly, you yeah. know? Yeah. World War II is very easy because it's very easy to demonize Hitler and sort of say, it's, these were the bad guys and these were the good guys. This is like, World War II is like one of those rare, rare moments in history where there's like, yeah, those were the bad guys and those were the good guys. Yeah. That is not the majority of human conflict. Yeah. Like, we, we constantly look back to that because it's so easy and we want to yeah. make movies about that. I mean, Nazis were kind of like Hollywood villains. So like, yeah. it's just like we focus on that conflict because it's so easy and it's like, human history is not easy. Yeah. It's not pretty. It doesn't make good Hollywood videos, but we still need to know. Yeah. Speaking of making Hollywood movies and this like, this divorce and this unwillingness to, to take a bold look and a clear look at what's happened is we still have this turning away. Right. So even when we're dealing with stories about the Congo, they usually get separated from, from. them. And that's something that um, King Leopold's ghost brings up is like this story has kind of been forgotten. It was like a big deal at the time, mm -hmm. but it's really kind of been forgotten at this point. And he brings up like instances where of like, Joseph Conrad's uh, Heart of Darkness, which is like, we make about so many different themes and no one says like, actually it's about the Congo and what was going on there. Yeah. I mean, like I studied that book in college. My professor never made it about Congo. It was about like, oh, this thing and that thing and like it's theme. It's a super ego in the end. Yeah, yeah. And never like, what honestly I think Con Con Conrad was pretty clear about like, no, no. Guys, this is about what's going on in Congo, right. you know, and but then like what happens when, you know, Heart of Darkness is turned into a film. It's about Vietnam, not yeah. about Congo. Or even like there was a, a recent Ad Astra is yeah. ba partly based on um, Heart of Darkness. It takes place in space. There's no mention of Congo. Yeah. So we always like want to turn away from what this story is about. Yeah. I will say in apocalypse is now now's defense like what we did in vietnam is thematically so similar i understand using that story I understand, to, yeah. to hide because by the same token we really should be taking a good hard look at what what we did in vietnam yeah but yes you still never get to sort of say let's look at congo for what happened in congo let's look at rwanda for what happened in, in rwanda. rwanda let's yeah. look at all of these different nations let's look at the way that we drew borders a Straight, straight through well, communities like, yeah you know yeah. it has nothing to do with the reality of who those people were it only reflects the reality of our systems of power yeah yeah and it's frightening yeah i i honestly like had a couple of days after and like i'm admitting this is like on me that i was like so you know poorly mm -hmm. educated like you you have to come to that point where you're just like oh i have allowed myself to just like listen to other people yeah and I am now need to be responsible for my own education because, yeah. you know, when at the time when other people were responsible for my education, 
I didn't get the truth a lot of yeah. times. But they were honestly like a couple of days after I read this where I was just like, I don't feel good about yeah. like my own country and my culture and the place I've like the ideology that I've grown up with because mm -hmm. like so much of this book is about like, hey, you know, like it's not directly saying this, but it's in essence like, hey, you know that thing you were been you've been told your whole life? Actually it's this. Yeah. You know, and you're just like, oh, okay. Yeah. And it, this really like kind of pushed me over a cliff where I was like deep dive whatever book I can get, whatever podcast I get, not just about Congo, but like about basically yeah. history and like European and American involvement in a lot of these different things that, you know, were, were fairly whitewashed for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for me, because it's the same essence, it is that moment when I realized like, oh, Belgium actually isn't particularly bad we're just comfortable saying that it is right. because they don't hold enough power and it allows us to have those feelings of self-righteousness. Oh, yeah. I found the bad guy and I know who he is and he isn't me. And they're old timey people. And this has nothing yeah. to do with my generation exactly. or my, you know, my, anything that has to do with my world. Like, yeah. cause look at the picture of the people there in funny clothes that don't yeah. look like mine. They don't look like me. So it's definitely not about my, my world. Well, and even for the contemporaries, it was like, it's not England, it's over there. Right, We're not exactly. doing it. And so yeah. it's always, like you said, it's this unwillingness to have a good, you know, you want to turn away from it and you don't want to yeah. look at it. And, and I think that combo, that one, two punch of just saying like, well, I want to find it somewhere. I'm going to identify it somewhere, but in doing so, I'm going to absolve myself from the guilt. Right. Because I found it somewhere else and I wasn't willing to look at myself. Right. Yeah. It's hard stuff. Additional books. Yeah. This really pushed me into like a lot of books and a lot of resources. Um, I think the one I want to bring up, which, uh, which was equally as impactful for me that I never would have read yeah. if I had not read King Leopold's Skulls, which is The Ghost Wars. Well, they both have ghosts in the title, um, but it's Ghost Wars by uh, Stephen Cole, uh, or actually it might be Steve Cole. Um, it is the history of Afghanistan from the 1970s up to September 10th, 2001. Oh, wow. Um, it's a huge book. It's the kind of book where I feel like I'm going to need to read this several times in order to like fully absorb everything because mm -hmm. there's like that's a really big period of time. Yeah. Um, I was honestly crying by the end of it. It yeah. is so hard um but part of what made me want to read that was like i started seeing a lot of people suddenly post things on afghanistan on the internet and like make it a very black and white thing and i was like you know what i've learned <laughs> when people reduce things to like you know a headline that's probably not true but i was like also like even though i've grown up in the war on terror era I don't honestly know, I don't feel like I know enough yeah. about this situation. Because I was like 10 years old. Yeah, you know? like, and you're just kind of like, you know, I'm, and also like I've learned that like I like need Like I remember Clinton getting elected, but like I don't really remember HW at all or the first time that we were in Afghanistan. Yeah, like there was, I've, I've learned to be like aware of when I don't have enough education and to not be like, well, uh, based on this limited amount of information that I have, I'm going to make a judgment call. I'm like, no, like I'm acknowledging to myself, I don't know enough about this situation. Yeah. I need to know more. And then my husband just like, we were in the bookstore and he's like, have you heard of this book? I just heard about it. And it's like, it's a brick. <laughs> it's a tome. I, I got it in audio because I was like, I, this scares me. <laughs> yeah. Put in my AirPods and <laughs> I painted a very large painting while listening to that one because it had a lot of stuff. But it is, it is very you know, it's kind of like leads you to the place of like, oh, of course, nine eleven happened. Yeah. Like, how could it honestly not? Yeah. Considering what happened here, and so, you know, that one I think is like in a way even more important because our culture is so intrinsically connected to that now. Yeah. Like it's really strange how much our country is connected to that and has been since mm -hmm. the 70s like this isn't like the story of like oh after september 11th boots on the ground yeah. like no like we have a history with that country yeah. going back that far yeah and it was yeah it was devastating but also one of those moments of like i needed to know this yeah we should all probably yeah no we should all know this so yes i Start with King Leopold's Ghost. It's a little bit more manageable. 
Um, but I do recommend Ghost Wars by Steve Cole. I will also say, like, we've discussed a lot about this book. It, like, don't assume that you know much from, like, there's so, it doesn't seem that long, but there's so much information yeah. packed in here. Like, even if you have read, you know, a podcast or listened to a podcast on this or like that, there's so much here. It's yeah. completely worth the read. Absolutely. And I also think it's very readable. It's a very yes. strong narrative. So as a historical book, if you're used to reading fiction, if you're re used to reading stories, this is laid out like a story. It's very well written. Yeah, so it'll be very approachable. My next book recommendation would be Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. This is a fictional book, and it's not very long either, but this story is about um, our main character as a man who lives in Africa who experiences the coming of uh, missionaries to his community and to his area, what, how he feels about it, how it affects his culture, how it affects his family, and how his life is negatively impacted, even by things that we, you know, frequently think of charitable, good works, whatever the case may be, right. as being a positive influence in these communities, and how much it ignores the culture that already existed there, right. the structures that already existed there, the fact that these people have been living and having wonderful, fulfilled lives for you know centuries. So that's a really accessible one for if you're looking for more of a narrative, more of a story for once. I mean, honestly, I feel like that would be like a really good companion to this because this yeah. is kind of like an overview where you're flying overhead, like watching all this, and that's someone on the ground, ground yeah. level. So I think that would be like a really good combination read with this. Yeah. So those are our recommendations for further books on this topic. Yes. Anything else? I think we've covered a lot. Yeah. Yeah. As a, it is, I mean, I just, I just feel like saying like, please, please read this book. It is an audio. Mm -hmm. So if you prefer to read like that, there's an audio book. That's how I, the first time I read it. Same. Um, yeah. And it, it's a really well produced audio book. I got it on the library, you know, so it's, it's out there. It's available in many different formats and please read it. Yeah. And if you uh, want to find out more about our podcast, you can find us on youtube.com slash a lovely jot. You can find us uh, as the novelty podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, okay. all those good places. And so if you want to sit and watch or if you want to take us on the go, both options. Absolutely. And until next time, this has been the novelty podcast. Thank you. Bye. Bye.